Well, welcome to the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. My name is Carl Sitchin, and I'm the director of the Institute. And I am extremely pleased to welcome you to our annual, uh, what I think we're going to call our annual event, seeing as it's the second year in which we've hosted a launch event for Fair Dealing Week. The Institute is proud to support Fair Dealing Week. It uh, aligns very much to, to our commitments towards access um, and scholarly openness and transparency. Uh, and uh, we have a fantastic lineup uh, for you this evening or whatever time of day it is where you are. Um, this event follows on from our inaugural Fair Dealing Week launched UK at Isles uh, in 2022. Jane Sikar and Chris Morrison from Copyright Literacy will once again present uh, host tonight's event. They are joined by guests Kyle Courtney and Amanda Wakarek. And uh, our, our event tonight is scheduled for about an hour and a half. So without further ado, I'm going to turn uh, over tonight's proceedings. Uh, to Jane and Chris. And once again, thank you for joining us. I hope you have a good event. Okay, thank you very much, Carl. It's uh, great to uh, be with everybody this evening. And um, we're just going to uh, do a short introduction um, and uh, just let you know a bit about what's going to happen um, at the event. So I'm Jane Secker and I work at City University in my day job. And um, I'm one of the um, organisers of this event. I guess that's what we call us. Yes. Uh, and run the website copyrightliteracy.org with Chris. And my name is Chris Morrison. I'm the copyright and licensing specialist at the Bodleian Libraries at the University um, of Oxford. And so Jane and I uh, run the website copyrightliteracy.org, uh, as, as we've said. Um, and this is one of the subjects that's very close to our, our um, yeah, area of interest. Um, so here's the website. This is where we, um, uh, as you can see, we have blog posts about things such as Fair Dealing Week. I think this was last year, uh, but there's updated blog posts, all the resources that we um, make available, we do through this website, much of it which is openly licensed as well. So we're very much wanting to make this an open and accessible um, area. So Absolutely. we we take playful approaches to copyright. We created Copyright the Card Game, uh, a board game called The Publishing Trap, about scholarly communications, uh, open access publishing. And we also have uh, an annual event, the International Copyright Literacy Event with Playful Opportunities for Practitioners and Scholars, also known as Ice Pops, which we'll mention a bit more about later, later. on. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes. So very quickly, as part of this introduction, we say, well, what is copyright? We think most of the people tuning into an event like this would already know, but this is how we uh, explain it in hopefully accessible terms. It It's a type of... Um, law that protects things that are known as works, so creative works, such as literary, artistical, musical, dramatic works, um, films and sound recordings. So there it protects certain things. Then there are usages, activities that it regulates. And this, these are the icons from our copyright, the card game. Uh, so copying, issuing copies to the public, performing works in public, communicating to the public by means of electronic transmission, rental, lending, adaptation, and then there are things you can do with permission of the rights holder. So there's, here's a, a, a range of different types of license, um, some of which are specific organisations that provide licences, other more generic ones such as library resources or website terms and conditions. Um, but legal use with permission isn't actually the only way that you can legally use. Um, it isn't, content. no. And this is where what we're focusing on as part of Fair Use and Fair Dealing Week are copyright exceptions, which are legal uses where you don't have the permission of the rights holder and we'll come on to all the reasons why that might be as part of our excellent talks today. Mm. So fair dealing, what is fair dealing? Mm. So um, one of the things um, that it says in the UK about fair dealing is it's asking you to think about um, whether you're a fair and honest so have we got a fair-minded and honest person here in the room, do you think? Have you looked at our delegate list? I, they all seem pretty fair-minded and honest, but it'd be very interesting to get their feedback on some of the ideas and, and thoughts that we're having today. But yeah. yeah. So not, not a not a horrible rotter then. No. No, no, okay. No, no. Fairness. It's it's all about making judgments really and using um your sort of critical thinking to sort of think about various factors. 
So this is particularly relevant for us in the world of teaching yeah. um, and where we are advising people who are trying to uh, convey ideas, get their students to engage with creative work. Um, and that was something that's been a constant question within universities where we work. Is it OK if I do this as part of my teaching, as well as, of course, around research and communicating that and engaging with the public more widely and all of those activities involve um, consideration of copyright exceptions. Absolutely, yes. So we've got various key um, exceptions where the fair dealing um, concept applies. Um, and we've got some of them um, from UK law on the screen there that we think are most relevant in an educational establishment. So such as a university. So section 29, which is um, allowing you to make copies for research or private study. We have section 30, which is quotation. Um, and then very importantly, section 32, illustration for instruction. So we saw a bit of illustrating for instruction on the screen there. We should clarify that we're talking here about the UK legislation, which is the Copyright Designs and Patents Act 1988. An illustration for instruction was something you did some research on yep. to look at how it was being interpreted um, by UK universities when you did your master's at King's College, wasn't yes, it, Chris? It we also have, um, yeah, I was going to say... The caricature of parody and pastiche. So, yeah, other indeed. kind of key. Uh... I think the slide just wanted to advance itself there. I didn't touch it. <laughs> okay. But that's quite an important one because uh, it's it's a recent addition to UK law, uh, but something that we've seen an awful lot of case law around in the US. Um, and it'll be interesting as well to reflect with Amanda, um, our keynote speaker, whether there are. Uh, similar sort of conversations what's been happening mm. in Canada mm. um, so this is a slide that we had last time around where we talked about the difference between fair dealing and fair use fair dealing has its basis in British or English law um, and fair use is a development of that, that that comes is within the tradition of US law um, so there are differences and I think we'll we'll dig into that and I think particularly interesting to have Amanda's perspective on this because um, in some ways, Canadian law is aligned with British law more because it was you know, more recently um, aligned with, with UK um, and Britain in terms of its governance. Uh, but at the same time, there are factors that make it, I think, more like US law. So fair use is a, is a more flexible and broader doctrine, whereas fair dealing, some of those things we saw earlier on, there had to be those specific purposes to which activities uh, must be put for them to actually for, for, for the fair dealing uh, defense to apply uh, so more of that in a moment yes absolutely so um it is fair dealing week and um we've got um another event happening later this week um that is being organized by the uh, scottish Consor consortium of university and research libraries so if you're interested in that you can find out about that on our blog but it is as we say the second year that the uk has been celebrating fair dealing week and we are really excited um about that and uh, really keen to build on all the work that's been done in the us and in canada to sort of raise the profile of the importance of having a more flexible regime when it comes to copyright. And there's some great talks there. So one of the speakers at this event is going to be Professor Emily Hudson at King's College London, um, whose book, Drafting Copyright Exceptions, looked at a comparison between those different jurisdictions, between uh, the UK and Canada, the US, Australia. Um, uh, but she's reporting on the latest from a, from a project she's been working on looking at copyright exceptions and their use within uh, scholarly publishing and scholarly monographs, which is a really hot topic at the moment. And there's also uh, a presentation from Dr. Zoe Krokida, who's at Stirling University, looking at upload filters and what's happening across Europe. So both of whom have been guests on our regular webinars. Mm. Here's a chance for them to, to provide the, the latest uh, on, on their research. OK. We, we mentioned Icebox. Yes, we have got um, a later in the year, uh, our conference, if you're interested. So again, more details are on our website about that. But that's just to save the date at the moment for the 20th of July, if you're interested um, in uh, sharing and coming along and finding out about uh, exciting and creative approaches to copyright yeah. education. And the theme that we're, we're returning to the theme of playfulness for this particular um, edition of Ice Pops. And we have two keynote speakers, one of whom is uh, Professor Nicola Witten, 
from the University of Durham, who is a leading expert on playfulness and, and uh, in, embedding play into um, adult work and adult activity, not just for children. Um, and we also have Dr. Amy Thomas, who is at Glasgow, whose work is on uh, copyright and games and the gaming industry. Mm. So we've got a really fascinating programs going to be developing around that theme. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. One last thing, while I have a few people listening, there is an event um, at Oxford. So the Oxford Festival of Open Scholarship. Um, this will involve probably some um, discussions around fair dealing, but largely it's around the, the, the broader copyright regime and how it supports open access. So we're delighted um, to be uh, receiving Professor John Walensky from Stanford, who's going to be talking about his proposals for copyright reform in order to support open access publishing. We've got Professor Asuna Steffe from Barcelona, who will have a different perspective um, from uh, the, the European civil law uh, uh, way of looking at things. And then we have uh, leaders from the world of libraries and publishing, Chris Banks, the director of library services um, at Imperial, um, and Andy Redman, who is the director of open access academic publishing at Oxford University Press. So there is a uh, link there that we'll make sure we get in the chat. It's both an in-person event in the afternoon as well as an online one. So okay. I hope to see you there. Um, so the schedule, we are nearly ready to hand Hopefully over. we're sticking to time here. We're sticking to time, yeah. 14 minutes um, So Carl Courtney, architect, uh, designer of Fair Use Week, which we call Fair Dealing Week. Um, <laughs> and then we're going to hand over to Amanda after that. Uh, time for some questions, but then a, a discussion on, on where things are, you know, where we think the state of play is with Fair Absolutely. Dealing. Um, and then we should finish by half six. Absolutely. So we're really looking forward to that. So without further ado, I think this is the moment. This is a, a fantastic photo taken a couple of years ago. Um, I think not the first time that we'd met Kyle Courtney, who's from Harvard University, joining us today. Um, but um, Kyle, we'd really be interested to hear a bit about why celebrate fair use? Where, where did this idea come from? And you've just told us that it's the 10 year celebration. So it's 10 years since you established Fair Use Week. We're only a little bit behind the times in the UK. So over to you. The floor is yours if you'd like to um, uh, uh, tell us a bit more about where this all came from. Sure. Thank you so much for having me back. Um, I, I thought it was interesting. I hope I'm considered a fair minded and honest person as required by <laughs> did fair you see dealing. Me did you see I me? did. I did. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, in many ways, certainly um, the concept of, of fair use week slash fair dealing week. Um, is a little bit of coming home. And so I'm delighted to be able to uh, appear with my colleagues across the pond, because as you mentioned, the four factors emerge from early English cases, right? So we certainly borrowed and built upon that idea. So Fair Use, Fair Dealing Week is a great example of successful grassroots organizing by cultural institutions, including libraries, archives, museums, and other institutions to celebrate, obviously, my most favorite of all exceptions, but I think one of the most critical of all copyright topics, which is fair use and fair dealing. Um, so, so here in the US, uh, we have the Copyright Act of 1976, right? That's our, our core fundamental on the books law that says, you know, rights holders have a bundle of rights. It's very similar to what you pointed out when you said, oh, here's what copyright law is. But what's important about fair use, it says specifically the language, it says despite these exclusive rights and the length of protection, copyright law recognizes the need for, for what's been referred to as breathing space, right? The idea of being able to harness works without permission. Um, and our list, if you will, is for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research, right? And that right allows us to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. That's our constitutional narrative. So this is the way that fair use is certainly important. Um, and one of my favorite quotes about this, I think I said this last year, but there's a 1986 case here in the United States called Max Tone Graham. And it says, from the earliest days of the doctrine, and they mean both fair dealing aspects of early common law and also what we have as fair use, courts have recognized that when a second author uses another's protected expression in a creative and inventive way, the result might be the advancement of learning rather mm. than the exploitation of that first creator. So that idea that, that the fundamental notions of democracy and the values that we have here in the United States has a strong public interest in allowing fair uses. So 
as can be surmised from this language and, and some of the cases here, although there's a lot of fair use cases, um, the right of fair use is a natural ally, I think, of library related work. Um, libraries often provide all sorts of materials to their patrons for criticism, comment, teaching, scholarship, and research, right? And we have a four-factor test. And this four-factor test is utilized here um, as kind of a, a litmus test, right? What we can and cannot do, right? So we don't have to go to court <laughs> in order to make a determination of what a fair use is, right? So by reviewing the factors as a court might, a librarian can determine whether or not the action she's taking might risk infringement or fall squarely within the realm of fair use. And so that idea of learning and promoting fair use as part of the library environment um, and as a critical safety valve mm -hmm. on copyright laws, users' right to accommodate a range of activities that libraries are doing is how we certainly came to the conclusion that fair use speak might be something that's, that's important to our community. So without fair use and the, and the library's celebration of it in particular, I think copyright could be used as a monopoly to inhibit progress. And very much part of the library mission is to promote progress, right? Um, certainly without the fair use, the quick evolution of technology, including you know, the VCR and sampling and all this other stuff would not be possible. And certainly libraries are early adopters of technology, right? We allow the stuff here. My first VCR, I rented <laughs> from my local mm -hmm. library. So that idea is that Fair use is a flexible doctrine in service of the library mission, accommodating new technologies, adapting copyright to the digital era is, is part of that library mission. So here, uh, when we founded Fair Use Week 10 years ago, um, it was based on the fact that, you know, the inherent mission of libraries is the scope and breadth of supporting education, learning, access, general reading, uh, so we got together and we said, let's do a full week of activities, right? It, it emerged from a, from a document that was about how libraries and archives could enhance fair use. And there was a fair use listserv that started up and they said, we should do a week, just like open access week. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I had just gotten my job here at that time, 10 years ago. And they were like, maybe we'll do it next year. And I was like, no, we need to do it this week in order for me <laughs> to justify my employment in my new position. Um, so after our first year, uh, ARL, American Research Libraries, uh, uh, in year two formed up and really helped launch this thing into the international celebration that it is today. Um, so we're very delighted that the UK has come on board in, in the second year here with Fair Dealing Week. And thank you, Jane and Chris, again, for, for letting me come and talk a little bit about your cousins across the pond and their fair use law. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. It's always great to have you. And we're really delighted you're going to be joining us at the end, I think, for the panel discussion. So Absolutely. Pick up some of those points. That'd be lovely. OK, so I think the time has come to introduce the, the main event, our speaker for this evening. Absolutely. So Amanda Wakaruk is Copyright and Scholarly Communications Librarian at the University of Alberta. So we first became aware of Amanda's work when uh, she published a, uh, a paper along with her colleague Celine Garibrenon, also at the University of Alberta, about copyright anxiety um, and copyright chill. Um, I won't say too much about that because clearly that's what we've invited Amanda to to come and talk about today mm -hmm. uh, but the thing that we we found that really interesting because it very much linked to the work that Jane and I have been doing on copyright literacy and some of the negative emotions that we've uh, found that people have when thinking about copyright mm -hmm. and but I think what's particularly interesting as I mentioned before uh, about uh, Canada and Canadian law is that there has actually been a fair amount of case law that has looked into some of these copyright exceptions, particularly in a library and education environment. Um, so we can see some interesting lessons from mm. from uh, some some Supreme Court decisions and uh, and some some pretty big and and and, and chunky cases that we've had um, around testing the, the limits of fair dealing. Um, so put all that together, and I think it's you know we're really pleased that Amanda. Um, agreed to get up very early in the morning uh, to to join us today. Yeah. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to um, Amanda and say welcome. And 
check that you can get your slides up and there they are and, yep. and the uh, floor is yours. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's uh, it's wonderful to be here. We've in Canada, we've also had fair dealing week activities for, for a number of years, and it's 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 fantastic to see how it's grown over the last decade. And and, and you're absolutely right, Chris, we have a lot of case law. Uh, especially in the last decade that I, I'd like to jump into. But but first, I just want to say thank you for, for inviting me to speak. And, and yes, I am definitely going to focus on the Canadian experience of fair dealing with a view from higher education. And while I'm not expecting many viewers today to be Canadian, given that much of the country is enjoying a statutory holiday, as I think they are in the US as well, uh, I suspect that most, if not all of our viewers reside in countries that have signed the Berne Convention, right? And of course, these are countries where the legislative framework for copyright can be described as a bargain, as a negotiated agreement, or as a deal between the authors of literary, artistic, and other works, and the broader public who make use of those works. So to quote what a few people have called the best-selling business book of all time, deals work best when each side gets something it wants from the other. Now, I realize that that's not exactly a profound statement, but it can be said to describe copyright legislation. In exchange for creating and protecting statutory rights that give creators expansive economic rights, the general public benefits from access to those works with limited rights to reuse them. Fair dealing, of course, as we've heard, is one of those limited rights. But assessing whether or not the use of someone else's work is fair cannot be determined by a bright line legal test. There's no absolute metric like a speed limit to tell us whether or not something is fair. That, that would simply be inappropriate. As implied by the UK case law on this, this quoted on the screen, Hubbard v. Bosper. And um, you know, our courts continue to use a balancing test Weighing, weighing factors that gauge the benefit to the user and the public at large against the potential harms that may, or the harms that may have befallen the rights holder. And that sort of interpretation and determination can only be based on the specifics of the case at hand. And that type of assessment could certainly be understood to be an art. So I'm really pleased that Kyle gave us a bit of an introduction to US, um, US legislation, but I'd just like to sort of provide a context from my perspective as well, because of course that art is formed uh, based on legislation, right? And in the US, the relevant legislation includes an open list of purposes for dealing fairly with the work, which is described as fair use, as we heard. Now, the legislation also provides factors that should be considered when determining if a use is actually fair. Um, and as Kyle alluded to, these include purpose, nature, amount and substantiality, and the effect of the use on the potential market. U.S. legislation also includes about a dozen other more narrow exceptions, many of which apply to educational institutions or might apply to educational institutions, depending on the scenario. Also worth noting is that there's no compulsory licensing scheme or mandatory blanket license through a collective society for literary works in Canada, in the US. Now, as I understand it, the setup is a bit different in the UK. And again, I'm so glad Chris and Jane spent a bit of time on this because I suspect um, with that introduction and just with living in the UK, most people in the audience are more familiar with the UK exceptions, so I will not go into detail, um, especially around the general exceptions for activities like research and private studies. But as a Canadian looking at this, it's interesting to note that more than three pages of the UK Act are dedicated to clarifying what dealings may or may not be considered fair. So as a Canadian, the legislation on the page in front of you, on the screen in front of you, is a bit shocking because neither of these codifications is in our own legislation, um, despite the fact that the Canadian Copyright Act was essentially copied and pasted, if you will, from the UK Copyright Act of 1911. Instead, this is the extent, the entire uh, extent of what is in Canada's current Copyright Act related to fair dealing. We have a closed list of purposes that includes research, private study, education, parody, satire, criticism or review, and news reporting. It's worth noting that 
education parody and satire were actually added in 2012, just over 10 years ago, right after a series of important cases were decided by the Supreme Court of Canada. More on that in a minute. Um, now, like the US, the Canadian Act does include a number of other more narrow exceptions, some of which can and do apply to educational institutions, as well as individual scholars, students, and educators. Also like the US, there is no mandatory licensing scheme for literary works in Canada, something that was challenged and recently, uh, recently challenged and affirmed by our highest court. At the end of the day, however, Canadian individuals and institutions who want to assess whether or not their dealings might be fair under the law and thus legally defensible will not find a helpful list of factors in the act itself, like the ones that we saw included in US legislation or a detailed description about what does or does not constitute fair dealing, like what we saw found in the UK legislation. For the vast majority of Canadians then, who only dip into copyright information at times of need, it can be difficult to understand that they need to piece together legislation, case law, and if relevant, institutional guidelines to determine if fair dealing might apply to the use of, of a work, right? So I apologize for the heavy text, but this is uh, this is the way it is sometimes. <laughs> and happily, there are rewards for the copyright literate and those with an affinity and tenacity for researching jurisprudence. As you will see, our highest court has provided us with both a framework for assessing whether or not a dealing might be fair, as well as a broader understanding of the fair dealing exception as a foundational part that they describe as users' rights under the law to be weighed against the rights of rights holders. Put another way, fair dealing is presented as more than simply a defense to a claim of infringement. And that is different to a matter of degree from what's happening in other jurisdictions. So very quickly then, it is generally accepted that this approach in Canada began with the Taberge decision. The case itself was about transferring an artwork from one medium to another. Now, for the purposes of our discussion, what's important is that the court describes the act as presenting a balance between promoting the public interest and obtaining a just reward for the creator, recognizing that the creator's rights are limited. So a lot to say about balance, and that is repeated in case law from this point forward. Forward. Okay, so that decision was delivered just over 20 years ago in 2002. And then a short two years later, we have the landmark and unanimous CCH decision. So this is CCH Canada versus the Law Society of Upper Canada. This case, which was brought forward by publishers against a library, considered whether or not making copies of legal decisions with the headnotes included, um, making copies of those decisions for lawyers, many of whom were employed by private law firms, was fair dealing. It marked the first time in our history that the Supreme Court of Canada specifically addressed the question of fair dealing under the Act. Now, in addition to determining that the dealings were, in fact, fair, the justices characterized fair dealing as a user's right that must not be interpreted restrictively in order to maintain the proper balance between the rights of rights holders and users, as mentioned in Taberge two years earlier, and built on um, you know, a history of case law, as we alluded to earlier. So the justices also provided Canadians with a framework in this decision, a framework for assessing whether or not a dealing might be fair in other scenarios. So it is within this decision that Canadians find both the factors to assist with the assessment of fair dealing, and the framework establishing what we now refer to as the two-step test. So the court outlined a number of factors upon which to assess the fairness of the dealing in question. These look very similar to the factors we saw earlier in US law, and that was noted in the case. Um, the case also notes, the decision rather, also notes the UK Hubbard de uh, decision that we saw earlier. So there is a recognition of, um, of other case law and other jurisdictions in their decision. Uh, and as you can see, those factors include purpose, character, alternatives to and amount of the dealing, as well as the nature of the work and effect of the dealing on the work. The court also recognized that there might be other relevant factors, but to date, they haven't offered any. And the court, the Supreme Court of Canada, I should stress, 
has considered many cases related to fair dealing since 2004. So we don't have time to go into all of this case law in de detail clearly, but I think it's, it's really the important takeaway here is that the uh, Supreme Court of Canada decisions that relate to fair dealing have um, repeatedly reaffirmed the CCH framework, the use of that framework set out in that decision. And in, that includes any dissenting opinions where they were, where they were provided. So just we're going to take a look uh, at Alberta and York University as cases in a moment. Um, but the other one I'd just like to highlight here is SOCAN, which is the second case on the list. SOCAN was important because it um, provided, it clarified the idea of a two-step test uh, in Canada, whereby the first step is checking the dealing against the list of purposes in the Act. And that has been understood to have a very low threshold. Uh, with the second step in, in the assessment being a much more thorough consideration of the dealing itself against the six factors that were listed in CCH, okay? Now, SOCAN also made it clear that the court wasn't concerned with the idea of transformative use. So that's something we hear a lot about in U.S. case law, and I thought it was worth pointing out. Um, so yeah, so the other, the two cases that relate specifically to the educational sector in Canada are Alberta Education in York, and they do speak to our discussion about fair dealing in Canadian educational institutions. And for those of us in Canada, they really have continued the story. Now, as an aside, I'd just like to say that if you want to dig into these cases a bit more, you can obviously read the decisions online. Uh, they're quite accessible in terms of uh, language and approachability. Um, and I've included some references at the end of the presentation. I'd also encourage you to take a look at Professor Michael Geist's commentary, which he provides both on his blog uh, and in the published collections of essays that, uh, that, he, that he's contributed to or, or edited, written by law professors and legal experts. Okay, so I mentioned Alberta. Uh, that case is from 2012, a year when we saw a number of copyright cases delivered by the Supreme Court. And Alberta is, represents a stand-in for all 13 provincial and territorial ministries of education or their equivalent. Okay? Uh, Access Copyright is the main collective society in Canada for literary works. Now, in this case, the collective society sued the government's because they felt that K-12 teachers making small excerpts of textbooks available to students was outside the scope of fair dealing and thus copyright infringement. In its decision, the court ruled against access copyright and also commented that the copying by teachers was considered to be on behalf of the students and thus that the fair dealing right remains that of the end user. And that's something that becomes very important in later cases. Now, as Professor Geist noted on his blog, and as I've reproduced on the screen, the court confirming that classroom copying could be treated as fair dealing, along with the legislative change to add education to the list of purposes for fair dealing, really should have prompted educational institutions to reconsider what fair dealing meant in their context. And indeed, it was a bit of a push and a precursor to the development of what we know as today as institutional guidelines. So that was how we came to have uh, guidelines prepared by individual institutions, so individual schools, universities, etc., and with and without language in the legislation. So what you're looking at on the screen is actually a list of the small excerpts included in the University of Alberta's fair dealing guidelines. It is remarkably similar, in some cases identical, to the list, list of um, uh, small excerpts in, in educational institutions across the country. The intention here is to guide university instructors as they decide whether or not their dealings in the classroom might be fair. It was originally based on the list of small excerpts prepared by Access Copyright itself, so the collective society as part of their blanket license agreement, and even then was considered to be overly conservative in nature. So this is around 2012. Still, the predecessor of Universities Canada, which is a nonprofit organization representing Canadian universities, 
promoted these institutional guidelines, despite their conservative nature and their modeling on the collective societies agreement, they promoted them as a way to establish a community of practice in relation to fair dealing. Now, this is important background because it seemed a bit odd to us in the education sector, uh, especially those of us working in higher education, when Access Copyright once again sued one of its customers, this time York University, for not paying tariffs related to a collective license. And that lawsuit uh, was filed in 2012. So that lawsuit was filed after York University chose not to sign up for that blanket license again. So they did not re-sign the Access Copyright blanket license. Instead, they chose to pay for their copyright commitments in other ways. So I know I keep stressing this, but it's really important for for everyone to understand that we do not have a compulsory licensing scheme for the literary works in Canada. So educational institutions are free to pay for the right to reproduce content in classrooms directly with publishers or via corporations that provide aggregated access to resources. And as everyone who works in higher ed today knows, for the vast majority of course materials, that's how universities, large universities especially, pay for the right to reproduce content in classrooms. Um, and of course, there's also a growing body of educational resources that are expressly open access, where the rights holder has assigned an open license and makes it clear that the user has all the author authorization they need to reproduce content in an educational setting or beyond. So in comparison, jumping back to 2012-ish, uh, the blanket license offered by Access Copyright only covered a very small amount of course materials used by students at a large comprehensive university typically, but the fees for that license were based on a number, the number of students attending the university overall. So by signing on to the blanket license then, the university was not only paying for works its students were not using, many of them, it was also paying twice in most cases for the right to use works that they were using because they were paying for them through other, other means. So when you consider that, along with the fact that excess copyright tariffs went from $3 a student plus 10 cents a page copied to $45 a student as a proposed increase. So $3 to $45 per student. Um, and you know we're talking about universities with between 30 and 60,000 students sometimes. Um, put it, so when you think about that, it actually seems like it would be fisc fiscally irresponsible for unity universities to continue with a blanket license when it's not offering anything beyond the, the old photocopy license, when very few people are using photocopiers anymore, right? So that's, that's irresponsible regardless of anything to do with fair dealing. On top of that, and now more than 10 years later, the business model of charging institutions to reproduce content when the provider of that content isn't actually providing access to the content itself, which is the case here, seems to be a bit outdated. And our Supreme Court agreed with that, ruling that tariffs are only binding if the parties have entered into a binding agreement. The court went further than that, though, stating that a mandatory tariff would be anti-competitive and boost collective society's power to the detriment of users. So Access Copyright, as you're probably not surprised to hear, has made a number of public statements about their strong disapproval of the court's decision. They are now aggressively lobbying legislators to change the Copyright Act changes that would essentially reverse this court ruling about mandatory tariffs and also restrict fair dealing to those works that are not commercially available under a license. Now, I know that the issue of mandatory tariffs has taken us a bit away from fair dealing, but I think it's worth mentioning this because the lack of a mandatory or compulsory licensing scheme for literary works is one of the areas where Canada and the US are similar and both, of course, as I understand it, differ a bit from the UK. So we just breezed through 20 years of case law, which is a lot to ask. And I, I, I apologize if that felt a little bit disorienting, um, but I'd like you to consider now how it may have felt to live through those 20 years as an educator or a librarian on the ground 
I work with many people in the education sector, and I would say they are fair minded and honest people who have taken great care to develop practices that respect both the rights holders and the users of copyright protected works. Because, of course, our faculty, our students, ourselves, we are all both rights holders and users of copyright protected works. So that good work is going on. And then it's challenged. It's challenged in a court of law and also attacked in opinion pieces published by news organizations across the country, not to mention submissions to a parliament to the parliamentary review of our Copyright Act, which wrapped up its work in 2019. Uh, as an aside, uh, the only changes to come out of that review have benefited rights holders, not users. So court decisions might represent the end of one level of disagreement or confrontation on an issue, but the anxiety and chill that they can create can be felt for decades. And that's what Celine Gennaro Brennan, a public service librarian at the University of Alberta, and I were seeing in our work like on the front lines. We were working with graduate students that were literally afraid to copy a chapter from a book that they had purchased themselves to mark up, you know, the scenario. Um, they were afraid the copyright police would find them and find them for making a chapter from a book that they purchased so they could write it up without uh, damaging the book they had bought. We've also worked with instructors who are worried about sharing images on an online management system, a, a system that is restricted to students alone. So copyright was clearly causing some anxiety and chill. And in my opinion, it should not be preventing academic work. Copyright shouldn't prevent you from doing your best academic work. But that's certainly what our professional experience was starting to indicate. And we looked for information on the topic and turned up very little. So we consulted with experts and crafted the copyright anxiety scale, which can be used as an exploratory tool to gauge the level of copyright anxiety amongst respondents. What the heck is copyright anxiety? Well, as you can see on the screen, we've defined it as in something that includes nervousness and apprehension associated with navigating copyright issues. This may result in copyright chill, where a legitimate use of copyright protected material is discouraged or inhibited by the threat, real or perceived, of legal action. And legal chill, of course, is something that you may be more familiar with. So the scale itself is constructed um, much like the library anxiety scale and the depression anxiety um, scale that was developed in previous decades. We have 15 Likert style questions, you know, the sort we see strongly agree or strongly disagree or neither, that sort of thing. We had uh, one question about formal copyright instruction, a yes, no, and a couple of questions about avoidance or, or hampered activities due to copyright uh, scenarios. So one of the, we, we ran the survey itself in September of 2019. Uh, we had 521 complete responses, and those were drawn equally from the US and Canada. And one of the responses is shown to you here as a frequency tabulation. We've made all of the tabulations available openly online. In this scenario, half of respondents agree or strongly agree that they do not know enough about copyright, which is double the number that disagreed with the statement. So it seems to us that the perceived need for copyright literacy uh, training and experience is key is clear. And these respondents, I should stress, are not only from the education sector. They identified themselves as working in a wide range of areas, including health, sales and service, business and finance, et cetera. Um, there's some other details about the respondents on the slide, but I'd also point out that 57% uh, of respondents reported having completed a college or university diploma or degree. So just going to share a bit more from that uh, survey our results, you can see in the slide, um, and sorry, the chart on the left, that respondents also told us that they do not feel safe using other people's copyright protected materials, with uh, less than 15% of respondents disagreeing with that statement. Perhaps, perhaps more striking, however, is the, the um, graph on the right, showing that 72% of respondents claim that they would have, they could describe a time that concerns about copyright hampered or prevented them from doing something. We asked those respondents to describe one of those scenarios in a few sentences. And it's interesting to note that the majority described uses that were for personal or non-commercial educational purposes. 
So it could indicate a fairly high level of chill for that group. All in all, this exploratory study seems to confirm that copyright anxiety does exist, in fact, to a greater extent and in a broader way than we may have originally thought. So I'm just going to share a full list of the questions that are on the scale in case you're curious. Uh, these are also available under a Creative Commons license in our paper, which was published in the Journal of Copyright in Education and Librarianship. And I'd like to note that we did test for statistically significant variation between things like gender and location, and there was only a very small variation for gender for two questions, seven and 11, with slightly more women feeling unsafe using copyright protected materials than men, and slightly more men feeling hesitant to ask for help with copyright questions than women. More interesting, perhaps, is the fact that there was no statistically significant variation for any of the questions when it came to location, which was a bit of a surprise for us. So no variation between, not a statistically significant variation anyway, between those who were answering from the US and Canada. So Celine and I are keen to find out if this might also be the case here in the UK. And we are very much looking forward to working with two tireless copyright champions, copyright literacy champions, I should say, Chris Morrison and Jane Secker, which everyone knows, as they develop and deploy a UK version of the survey for higher education later this year. And we hope to be able to deploy uh, the same survey simultaneously in Canada to, to find out if, um, if location remains uh, an, un, uh, an insignificant <laughs> factor. Uh, so there's the further reading I promised, and that wraps it up for me. Happy, happy to take questions. Thank you, yeah. Amanda. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. That's absolutely fantastic. We're, we're compiling lists of questions here and wondering whether we can just take up the whole of the 10 minutes between us with them. <laughs> we should leave time for questions from the floor as yeah. well. But so we do, I think we do have a few questions that yeah. we, we wanted to ask ourselves, but we would invite anyone to put something in the chat. Or, or raise your hand. Or raise your hand because we have set this up as a meeting so people can if they want to come on the mic. Yeah. Um, uh, I can't see anything right away. Do you want to uh, ask your first question about the, the kind of fair dealing, fair use, and whether essentially, despite all the the kind of complexity of it is it essentially just the same thing well i think what was really interesting in in seeing in listening to your presentation again hearing about what happened with the the university of york case and particularly around reprographic copying within universities now there's a clear difference there between what happens in the uk and what happened in canada and what happened in the us um and in the uk we do have this particular provision in the law that around that re, uh, reprographic uses within an educational institution. And it says, if there is a license available, then an institution has to take out that license. Yeah. And, and, and that's not there in Canadian law, and it certainly isn't there in, in US law. Mm -hmm. So there's a clear divergence at, at that point. But I was also struck by, you know, as you were pulling up those different bits of legislation and looking at, it, it's, it, it's the same language because we're part of um, you know, it's a, it's a global system around around copyright and uh, the, the, the global treaties that exist. So to what extent we've got different different laws in different countries that do in some cases have different outcomes. But in your experience, to what extent are the behaviours we see within within institutions um, sort of similar approaches that people take because ultimately the principles behind them are the same, even if the laws kind of push us in slightly different directions as a as a profession is is the library a profession and and the the sort of academic community are they kind of doing the same thing in these different environments yeah that's a great question and i can only speculate about um out of jurisdiction i i did work in the u.s for about a year at a higher at a university i've never worked in the uk but it strikes me that there is a, a global system based on capitalism <laughs> that provides access to works in a much um, more efficient way and and that's purchasing digital rights through this this you know publishers directly and aggregated systems and i think for the for the instructor the that is you know leading the course it's just simpler to do that if it's at all possible it's simpler for the institution to manage those rights 
through the you know the aggregators for, for sure so i think that's a shift in the last 10 years that's a definite shift when i talked about the blanket license earlier i was talking about a document that was crafted in an age of of paper only and anyone who works in a university knows that the photocopying that that license would have applied to uh has declined precipitously i mean uh, that's that's just the reality of moving to a digital publishing model so i think the practices around acquiring course materials is probably similar uh in the multi in, a, in the jurisdictions we've talked about and because of that growth i i think the fair dealing or fair use exception is becoming as become as kyle described it and others have described it more of a, a safety valve mm -hmm. than than anything else in terms of course materials now there are really critical reasons that the spare dealing should should remain a strong exception for freedom of expression in canada freedom of speech in the us um and other reasons but when it comes to course materials uh at, especially at large universities it, it's less and less of a, con of a consideration because it's it's not it's not as necessary as it used to be for course materials and excerpts right. yeah um, do we have a question, I think, from uh, in the chat, Chris? I think there is one um, I spotted. Um... I think it was a thanks from Alison saying okay. that she used to do rights clearances at UBC around the time of the um, Alberta and, and York cases. Um, so a trip I suspect that she would have some, some uh, she would have a, a, an innate understanding of anxiety and chill. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, that, that kind of takes me to one of my questions I have then. So do you do you think librarians make copyright anxiety worse or do you think they make it better? I mean, in some ways, if you raise awareness of copyright, sometimes people didn't go know that what they're doing, you know, they just they just act, don't they? They just do things. So I don't know. Is it is it is a kind of. I certainly found when we did our research that sometimes librarians reported being more anxious about copyright the more they knew about it. I think there's possibly a tipping point where then they start to feel better about it. But I think there's this kind of place where they start to learn about it that maybe leads to greater anxiety. I, I, I would agree. I, I, I think that's very much the case, especially when you have case law weighing on on a university for over a decade, which is the case in Canada, the, the copyright anxiety and chill among librarians in Canada is um, is, is a real phenomenon that, that we see in conferences and in discussions. Um, but I think part of the response, the response should be at least twofold. And, and that is one, making it more accessible by making it more fun, which is why the work that, that you and Chris do is so important. And, um, and, it, and and also really um, making it clear that we have statutory rights as users. And that's where yeah. our Canadian courts have uh, provided a bit more oomph in that area. Yeah. Yeah. When I go into a classroom, I frame the conversation about rights. That's the framing is that, you know, you have the, the students sitting in those chairs have rights both as creators and users and we talk about what that means and and how they should consider sharing what they're creating and then consider when they're using others how how that might feel and and to go back to the fair-minded and honest approach it's 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 yes. a it's a good one yeah yeah i wonder if we could uh, ask kyle if 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 you're able to give um your perspective from from the us there i mean they're based on my first question there were that we've had the Georgia State University case, uh, but then it seems to us from where we are that the US institutions have been quite bold and progressive in this area. Um, how do you kind of pitch, see yourself in, in, in comparison with, with what you hear from Amanda and other colleagues in Canada and then what you know from, from talking to people in the UK? Sure. So uh, first of all, thank you, Amanda. That was fantastic. I learn something new every single time I watch you talk. Um, uh, although I have anxieties too. <laughs> um, so, uh, so a, a couple of things. I, I, I wonder overall, all, all of our countries, all of our, our fair dealing fair use, are we naturally trading convenience of technology through paid licensing rather than fair use, fair dealing user rights, right? So is it actually 
why does one have to be more convenient than the other? It's my uh, my question, right? Because mm -hmm. the other side, the, the rights holders and licensing organizations, perhaps they're using technology, I, you know, the convenience of access to lock away user rights in a way, right? And so that's where that's where I, I get that that type of concern um, addressing this because because they're the licensing regimes in the two countries that are represented uh, today are, are broader and more expansive than here, right? We don't have rights collection society. Google Books case um, clearly uh, rejected a rights-based society settlement um, here in the US. Um, uh, the judge was like, no. Um, so, so, you know, my, my fear of course is licensing undercutting the user rights as opposed to promoting it in some way. And I'm not anti-licensing. I want to be very clear. I'm anti-bad licensing. <laughs> and that's a very, that's a unique kind of thing. So, uh, but as far as the bold moves, we did have some litigation in there that was during a time um, that I, I didn't know if we should be bold, right? So Georgia State and the library system that had a very reasonable and fair, fair use policy with regards to their e-reserves was sued. It took 12 years of litigation to decide whether one chapter or 10% and in one or two cases, 20% or two chapters was fair, right? 12 years of litigation for that. Hattie Trust, another amazing kind of decision, took six years, right? Google Books, same amount of time usually. So, so I think we're more bold recently because we had litigation that settled what I perceive of as libraries um, enhancement of fair use rights for their communities, right? Their patrons. Um, but it still doesn't mean that we don't have fear because uh, you can sue and you can be sued for a number of things, or you can get nasty takedowns or retroactive license fees and all sorts of other stuff. However, we have an interesting shield here in the US and I would love to know if this exists elsewhere, which is the big dollars with a fair use case against libraries or users comes from statutory violations, the statutory damages, like $150,000 per infringement, right? The big one, the willful and the thing. If a library employee makes a good faith fair use determination and they get it wrong and a court decides you got it wrong, there is a last damages phase statute that says despite the fact that they may get all sorts of infringement against them, statutory damages are not available against the library, archive, or educational institution. Right. Um, so when they get to the damage phase of the trial, it's not millions of dollars. It's like zero or a hundred bucks, mm. right? And so does that act as a shield, which could cause us, as Chris said, to be bolder here in the United States yeah. with regards yeah. to fair use determinations by ourselves. So sorry, that was, a, that was long. <laughs> I apologize. Okay. Thank you. So uh, it's a good it's a good point though yeah, whether that exists in um, the the law in the UK whether there's that protection. Well, or not it. as far as I'm aware of. It's something I've heard Emily Hudson talk about in relation to orphan works and as a solution, could there some way of actually limiting the remedies available to a rights holder there? And wouldn't that be a way of unlocking some of the fear around it? Is <laughs> to you know reducing what we talk about risk all the time and reducing that risk. Amanda, what's this, are you aware of what the situation is in Canada in terms of are there statutory damages in place and how 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 does that work? Yeah, there is a limit for non-commercial uh, claims, and I believe it's five thousand dollars as a top out, and right. so it's it's quite low. The reality is that the case law we've seen though that wasn't that wasn't an issue that wasn't a consideration. The York case was about tariffs. And so the right. amount that Access Copyright was claiming was owed fell outside of that shield, if, if I can use that language. So yeah. it, um, so it was in I forget the numbers off the top of my head, but but much much add a couple zeros for sure onto that mm. thousand dollars. Not to mention the as you know I'm sure many on the call know that the cost of a lawsuit is prohibitive, even if the statutory yeah. damages are low. It's a huge investment, and it's it's odd to think that a plaintiff would enter that without expectation of recouping those costs at the very least. Um, yeah, I think that, I hope that answers a response you know, mm, to that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is a question in the chat here from, I think it's, it's Michael. Um, has the quotation defense 
in England and Wales put the UK legislation on an equal and wide footing as the USA fair use doctrine. Um, does this notion not have grounding in what the Berne Convention has to say about fair dealing? Um, I guess that's a question more about what's happening in the UK rather than what's happening in Canada and the US. I mean, certainly our perspective is that it, it, there, there are arguments that it makes it broader. Mm. I'm thinking about the work that uh, Lionel Bentley and Tanya Applin have done looking yes. at the global mandatory fair use, which does, does certainly link to that idea of the Berne Convention. I think those of us in uh, positions like ours, where we are uh, advocating for copyright exceptions, we're not saying that they are now, it's the same right across the board, uh, but it certainly makes them, I think, more closely aligned. So I think if I can add to that question and, and put it back to both Amanda and Kyle, um, I'm thinking particularly about the codes of best practices in fair use that Peter Yazi and Patricia Alfterheide started at the American University in Washington, that um, we now we have now seen those being ported into Canadian law. We're certainly very interested in talking to them about how that can work in, in, in UK law. Mm. And certainly we had um, a conversation a couple of years back with, with Peter, who was saying, looking at it, actually the fairness tests that you do when thinking these things through as a professional look strikingly similar, even if the laws behind them are different. Amanda, do you think there is uh, what's your experience in, of working with those codes and how, what, what, where you see them working at the moment in terms of, of people making those professional judgments? Yeah, I, I think they're, they're vital to developing a community of practice. And we have benefited from the U.S. Um, you know, colleagues, Kyle and others, for creating, creating these, these types of, of, of guides, if you will. Uh, and then we we quickly try to create a Canadian version, which which we did with uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> with the legal framework to, uh, around controlled digital lending, for example, and also um, uh, best practice code of best practices for fair dealing related to open education that is coming soon. And it was largely inspired and kind of modeled, and it's a first iteration on the code in the US. And I, I think Kyle can speak to it more, but my understanding is that there has been case law, especially when it comes to documentary filmmaking, that actually references those codes, the codes that have come out of communities of practice. And, um, and so very important for the community and please correct me if I'm wrong on that one, Kyle. <laughs> no, it's it, it, that's the whole goal is to introduce that so it does get adapted into a, a case. Now, there's been plenty of briefs that have cited to it continually. The, my dream, of course, and I'm sure it's Brandon Butler's dream and Peter Yazzie's dream and Patricia Ofterheide's dream, is that the, the code of best practices of fair use in, in libraries gets utilized by a court in some way, right? That's how we develop. And, I, and I'm all for the community of practice being developed, but I... I'm even more excited that gets introduced into the law. And we've had the history of that. Best practices sometimes become the law. Um, in the United States, we have the Uniform Commercial Code, which is basically the best practices in making contracts between people and businesses. And it was, you know, eventually written down and, and then adopted by all 50 states, right? The UCC. So, so sometimes these best practices and these, these communities can develop standards that then get harnessed. Um, in there. And of course, one place where the the code of best practice has been harnessed by the court really is because of transformative fair use. Now, um, that's a very different area that was developed through common law. And then, you know, the community takes it in, comments on it, applies it, and then hopefully spits it out the other end. And so the, the courts will take it up again. Um, so so I I, I think the, the value in that is something that I think I discuss a lot with copyright first responders, which is myth busting, right? All amongst our communities, it's almost as critical to bust those myths that are out there about what is or is not fair, um, what copyright really is. I'm glad you opened with that, Jane and Chris. Like, here's what it really is. And even that can be enlightening to some community um, because at going back to Amanda's work, uh, knowledge and education lower both fear and risk, right, at the same time. Um, and that's a, that's a nice balance point. That's what these community documents and best practices do as well. Mm, it's a good, good point. I mean, I, I suppose one of the, the things, 
in the the UK, we've you know we had changes to our law in 2014. Um, we had these kind of new um, or broadened copyright exceptions in some cases, and it is hard because you know it, it's not that we we want there to be litigation against universities, but there hasn't been um, case law, so it's it's hard. I mean, people sometimes I remember being asked. Oh, well, what's a good example to sort of point out to academics what might happen to them if they get it wrong? And, you know, is there, you know, is there some sort of case law here? And, you know, as I say, I'm not I'm not saying I want that to happen, but we don't have a lot, do we, to point to? Um, not, not specifically about the thing that they are worried about. No, not, not specifically. You know, um, academic A gets sued no. for putting too much of an extract on a reading list for their students that that specifically hasn't happened it's the it all of this activity is framed by the, those uh the license agreements we've had and say in the uk certainly the copyright tribunal decisions that were made decades ago now mm. that sort of paved the way um so we don't have we, there's, there's lots of case law but they're, they're typically the ones where it's worthwhile people actually suing like um you know major media organizations and, and newspapers and, and, and yeah but i guess what we don't know as well is what might be going on um you know where there might be kind of letters sent saying take something down and you know things mm. that don't actually ever get to court as well so that's that's something which i think links to there's a second part of, of michael's first question here yeah. on the second point the chill factor appears to operate across um, everyone trying to fair deal the work, the person doing the fair dealing, mm. unless obvious, is always worried about whether the amount is correct or the acknowledgement is correct. Uh, and I think to add to that as well, there is, and I think this builds on the point you made there, Kyle, about knowledge being good because it reduces the fear and the risk. But actually, it, whoever they are in that information ecosystem, whether they're behaving as, as a rights holder, whether that's their role, or as uh, and we've we've seen it from 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 colleagues that we know in, in the publishing industry actually their dealing works for them as well so um there is a thing here which is um about this being a universal thing that that, that benefits everyone if they do understand it uh, mm. but that chill and that anxiety comes across in in different ways uh, depending on what particular role you're performing at any moment i guess so that I think it's interesting because the the anxiety might emerge from the fact that there's a dearth of of case law. Is that like mm -hmm. that idea? Like, oh, no one's ever commented on this before, mm -hmm. um, and that a court hasn't visited this specific scenario. Now you know common law, which we all suffer from on this call, which is great. Um, <laughs> common law has that that you know that that idea that it doesn't necessarily have to be on point. We can use plenty of analogies between cases to draw yeah. conclusions. However, let me flip that on the other side for a moment and say, well, if there is a lack of case law on a particular topic or area, that I think enhances the community evaluation of it, mm -hmm. right? That idea that, that best practices can emerge because there's no case law, but here's what we're all doing. Um, and here's what we think is fair and can well establish that, you know. So again, if there's a lack of comment on it from the courts, then the community should own that commentary. That's, mm. at least that's, that's, that's my two cents, which again, may result in less fear uh, that Amanda was discussing. Yeah, Amanda, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, that sounds ideal. In practice, it's a tricky thing. We all have administrators and we're lucky if they understand the basics of copyright. They have big jobs with, you know, a lot of moving parts and um, and and the, the the copyright literacy responsibilities of, of people in universities uh, go both go up and down in terms of hierarchy in the institution. And it can be challenging to put forth proposals for library services and programs that are are, you know, very much reasonable but sound scary simply because there's a legal component and there's, in, in our case in Canada, litigation, even if it's not even close to being on point, it can serve to hamper legitimate activities. So it's a, it's a great idea. I want to say yes, but on the ground, it can be, <laughs> it can be a good bit tricky. Yeah. I can see another question in the chat, and I think this is a good one to ask at this point. Um, Alia says, does fair use have an impact on controlled digital lending for libraries? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, yes. maybe I'll throw to Kyle first. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, absolutely. So let's just, let's just be clear that controlled digital lending is utilizing a fair use narrative in order to make its uh, most penultimate point. Uh, and that relies a lot on the, the doctrine of transformativeness. Um, so that's that's a, a more recent develop, although you know what's recent in the law the last 30 years or so, um, in, in the context that if you're using something for a purpose that's different than the original, and you're using enough of that where it seems reasonable in relation to that new purpose, uh, then you're capable of, of making that transformative fair use. Where this comes into account, though, is also the idea that in case, you know, there's some myth busting to be done on this webinar, controlled digital lending is about the, the materials, the books, the stuff that you already have and own, right, already on your shelves. I'm not talking about ebooks. I'm not talking about fancy copies on your Nook or Kindle or whatever. I'm talking about things that are on library shelves, and especially those things that never made the jump to the digital market. Right. So right now there's there's the lawsuit against Internet Archives version of controlled digital lending, which is called open libraries. And that is in New York. Well, this is an important case. But uh, the vast majority uh, of discovery that emerged from this case uh, indicated that I think it was less than 17. It might be 11 percent of the millions of works that Internet Archive has scanned in their open library systems has anything where there's a licensable market, right? Mm -hmm. Again, we're talking about the stuff that we think is low risk and has high scholarly value to the communities. No one else is gonna digitize these. They could be orphan works. They could be defunct publishers. They could be in the public domain. We're not sure, right? But it never made the jump to the ebook market. And the only reason this lawsuit is, is happening certainly is because they carefully chose some of the books that had an ebook market to be able to make that market argument. But they've been having trouble making that argument. What's the harm in someone checking out a book for three minutes, right? Yeah. What's the harm in that? So controlled digital lending is very much founded on the principles of, of fair use and how we here in the U.S. has interpreted it, transformative fair use, um, where we're using a technology to increase access without drastically encroaching on the rights holders market. And that's that balancing test. Absolutely. Amanda, would you like to um, say anything about, yeah, I mean, what, what's happening with CDL in Canada and, yeah, any of your experiences? Yeah, and we've, there's a lot of discussion um, and I'm actually on a working group of the Canadian Federation of Library Associations that is focused on CDL. And we've recently published um, a, a, a legal framework that is, is available in the partnership journal that, that spells out how fair dealing is, is really the narrative uh, for controlled digital lending in Canada. And um, <clears throat> that's a very recent publication, late December. So I, I would encourage people to take a look at that or the position statement. And on the ground though, um, my own institution, the University of Alberta, started engaging with CDL in 2015, I want to say, 2015. We, we digitized a large collection of curriculum, historic curricular materials. Um, and put it up on the Internet Archive for the world to use, very low risk items, and, um, and continue to talk about that and encourage other libraries to, to consider whether CDL is appropriate. Now, in our own institution, we've also started using CDL within our own risk assessments for new digitization projects, and we consider whether CDL is appropriate or not. It's a workflow for low risk print materials. And I guess that's our experience. But to add to Kyle's comments, I, another way that I often think about the use of CDL, especially for, you know, as we said, print materials that you own, is that it's, it's helping remedy a market failure. If, if publishers aren't providing access to their backlists in a digital form, let's face it, people aren't going to use it in this day and age without a lot of effort. And so, um, that's where CDL can be useful. CDL is not a cheap undertaking. Libraries spend a lot of time and effort uh, and, and technical you know, support to digitize something. We're not going to do that if it's already serving uh, our users in a more, uh, you know, less expensive and efficient, or efficient, sorry, way. So yeah. something to consider. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a really really good point. Actually, um, really helpful. 
No. Um, I can see that there is uh, another uh, question in the chat from, from Michael about um, a re reference to Goldberg versus Warhol estate case. I'm asking Kyle, can you comment on whether there has been a rowing back in the wide doctrine of fair use in the USA? Ah, the pendulum swinging. Yes. So <laughs> certainly we've seen some of, I mean, I think all our countries have seen pendulum swing with regards to rights and users' rights. Um, and of course, the Canadian, that year of all those copyright cases was amazing. I don't, I don't think I would be very stressed if I was in that role at that time. Um, however, so, so, Goldberg versus Walhar State is not necessarily rolling back. I think it's a, <laughs> I think it's a license scenario gone wrong. I think that the way that this was done, which was photos of prints were taken as reference photos in 1984. Later, somebody made Warhol, Warhol Warholized them and made a bunch of them. Decades later, Prince dies. And the Warhol Foundation licenses to Condé Nast to put on the cover of their magazine, like a rock, rock iconic God Warhol single photo. And that's when the photographer Goldberg notices like, hey, isn't that my photo? Um, but it, so it's, a, it's licensing. They're saying they didn't have the rights to transfer it, who didn't have the rights to transfer it to a third party. I'd like to say that the original photos were taken as reference photos. They refer to them as reference photos, meaning here's what prints look like in 1984, um, and it was designed to be utilized um, in different ways. Uh, Warhol, I would say, obviously made a transformative fair use of this, I think. If you, if you like Warhol, you know he's using it for a different purpose than the original. And if you look at these original black and white photos of Prince, he's all shy and he's real reluctant to be there, obviously. And then what do we have on the cover of Condé Nast? He's a rock god, right? He's been Warholized. But the concern was that transformative fair use had slipped too far. And yeah. so the Second Circuit Court kind of really trimmed it in a way that I think is not a concern for libraries, archives, and museums, right? I don't think that's of concern. What I think it's a concern is it starts drawing back and they just applied the wrong test of the Second Circuit. This is, I filed, <laughs> obviously in this, I said it should be remanded back down and, mm -hmm. and, and done again with the proper test because uh, they kind of, they went around what I perceived of as the normal course of understanding a transformative fair use like that. Um, so I, I, I'm hopeful. Again, my organization, Library Futures, filed along with a number of other organizations uh, in this case. Um, and we're hopeful that it will be remanded back with a note from the Supreme Court that says, do this properly, please. Use the action <laughs> that we have delineated just last term in Google v. Oracle. You know, they just had a copyright transformative fair use case. So. Okay, go, yeah. do your homework. Go back and try again. Yeah, that's what I think you it should do be. better. That's my opinion, though, of course. It's nice to hear as well that Kyle is hopeful, hopeful. hopeful. We want to talk about I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm ever hopeful in most of my <laughs> career. And I think the thing there is you, when you get into the detail of this, you see that law is a conversation and what happens I means there will always be things coming and moving on and progressing and changing. Mm -hmm. People often want to have that solidity and certainty and that's just not how things work. So you have to pick up all those different bits. Uh, I think we're, we're coming close to, to the end of our conversation today. Yeah. I'm just a quick uh, picking up of a comment from Alison there around uh, not very significant parody case law in the UK. We do have, we have had a recent court case around only fools and horses the UK sitcom mm. um, where there was somebody creating a dinner party experience. Um, so there's something in there, um, but it'll be interesting to see that develop. We haven't really had a chance to get into parody and satire. No, no. I think what we want to do to uh, finish this off, it is 10 years of the Fair Use Week, Fair Dealing Week. Um, so if we can start off uh, with Amanda, if you can give us uh, a sense of, if looking back over the last 10 years, I mean, how have things changed? If we're looking at not necessarily just the, 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 the jurisprudence, the court cases, but, but also the conversations you've been having, your own experience, how have things shifted? Is it, is it a positive shift? Is it just the pendulum swinging yet again? How would you typify that, that, that period of time? Well, I, for us, so much in higher education, I should say, so much centered on the York case. And to have them finally prevail after a trial court decision that that basically upheld the idea that mandatory tariffs were a thing, 
mm -hmm. um, to have that reversed and then challenged and, and ultimately settled by the Supreme Court was huge. And now uh, to tie back with the theme of my talk, it was a bigly win. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I do, I do, we do feel hopeful that that universities and and K twelve as well will now be allowed to settle their copyright um, commitments as as they see fit. And and so it, it is it is good to feel that that's not um, that that decision hasn't been taken away from us. Uh, however, there the legislative pressure is real and aggressive and it remains to be seen we had a copyright act review that did not add um add, add, did not implement changes that would have benefited the user mm. community so so it's it's interesting hopeful and cautious hopeful definitely and, cautious. The right yes, of course you, yeah. and you had your um term extended uh, to, yeah and there may have been oh. the impact of the dom <laughs> On, on that whole yeah, yeah. part of the story as but well. That's a whole other conversation. It's a, it's a, yeah, that's an entirely different conversation. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah. yeah, hopefully optimistic. That's okay. Great. Okay. And, and, and Kyle, um, any final words and thoughts of 10 years at the helm of Good Ship Fair Use Week? <laughs> um, I, I would like to say because 10 years went from, you know, three institutions celebrating it to over 100 now. Um, that we've disseminated the, the good word, so to speak, of how fair use and fair dealing uh, and, a, and a critical understanding of that can aid the library mission. Um, mm. We've had um, uh, uptake across the board, you know, lectures, uh, you know, comic books, all sorts of fun stuff, playful, mm. as you guys would say. Yes. Um, and, and, and certainly, I, I, I think, again, I'm naturally hopeful. So I, I think fair use here in the united states is for everyone commercial non-commercial scholarly etc i'm focusing on our slice of the pie and i think from our cultural institution um uh, point of view it's better more people are understanding it there's more folks that have my job now from when i started a decade ago i think there was like 30 of us there's like 110 now mm -hmm. that are like an embedded copyright person, possibly even a lawyer, <laughs> possibly yeah. even a copyright lawyer inside a university library system or an affiliated system like that. So it's not just in the general counsel's office or something like that. So I, I think that's part of the spread here. And we have a Supreme Court that's taking more copyright cases in the last few years than ever before. And so it's becoming a matter of national discussion, not just about fair use for libraries, archives, and museums, but fair use for, for everyone. So I'm um, hopefully that, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to next year's celebration already. I had like a hundred ideas and it's just this week, but uh, Fantastic. I, again, thank you again for, for having me. Yeah. Well, do, do have a look um, on Twitter as well, because we spotted that it, it is spreading around the UK. We've got um, a number of uh, universities in the UK, notably Imperial College, uh, Cambridge University Library and UCL running events this week, as well as the events that we've already mentioned at the start of the talk. Mm -hmm. I think it just, remains for us to thank you both because it's been a fantastic um evening or morning for, for kyle the day is just starting so yes i'm waking uh, i'm gonna go have lunch after this yes <laughs> and, and we're looking forward to seeing we hope both of you in the uk later this year if you can make it out well we know amanda's on her way over yeah so um i think anyone on the call if you know clearly there is an opportunity to meet face to face if you're into copyright um on between we the 19th continue, and the 21st of july continue some of these discussions yeah as well. absolutely yeah. um and and uh amanda um clearly will try to arrange as much of a tour of the uk and speaking to all the the key copyright people there are and visiting as many august institutions as possible so but thank you very much for getting up early and joining us today. Yeah, and back to, I think it's back to Kyle, isn't it now? No, it's back to Carl. Carl. <laughs> Carl get that my Kyle right. my files. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. That was, that was an in-joke. That was all very deliberate there. It was, it was. Yes. <laughs> uh, but, uh, well, thank you, thank you to all our guests. Uh, that was a fantastic uh, discussion and uh, once again, a great start to Fair Dealing Week. So uh, thanks very much for uh, uh, for today. And I, I hope next year we'll be able to follow it up with, uh, with another uh, launch event. Thank you to everyone who joined us.
uh, at remotely at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies in London. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and I hope you'll consider attending other events. Don't wait for an, a year. Uh, we've got lots of events, both in person and online. Our website is regularly updated with uh, uh, new opportunities to, um, to hear from us, to learn from each other. So we, we'll hope you join us soon. Until then, it's goodbye from me and from everyone at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies in London. Good night. <laughs>